So, you've decided you want to grow weed, but you're asking yourself, what will I need? Well, let's talk about it. The most important purchase you can make when it comes to your grow setup is your light. Perhaps tied with getting good genetics or perhaps a clone that you know is just bomb. Uh, but when it comes to maximizing your potential yield and quality, you're going to need a good grow light. I'm going to do a very in-depth guide on choosing a grow light soon. But for now, just keep in mind, you need a grow light. Feel free to drop uh, comments down below for these specific pieces of equipment as far as, you know, what you're looking at, asking my recommendations or letting me know what's worked good for you in the past. I'm not going to cover choosing specific pieces of equipment in this video, but I'm happy to answer those questions down below because I know some of you are already buying pieces of equipment. You're not waiting for my videos to come out and I don't expect you to. Um, it'd be good for everybody if I answer some of those questions down below because I know for sure you're not the only one with a question like, which grow light should I buy? Moving on from the grow light, you're going to need a grow tent. Kind of goes without saying, you're going to need somewhere to put your plant. And uh, grow tents are just really ideal in letting you control the environment in there pretty well, having spaces to put everything. It's got a drip tray typically, so it's collecting your water. You're going to need an exhaust fan and a carbon filter. Carbon filter is going to eliminate any of the smell coming from your tent. And the exhaust fan is just a fan. It sucks in air one side and blows air out the other. Technically, you could set these up either pushing air out of your tent or sucking air out of your tent. But the ideal way to do it and the way I recommend is having it suck air into your tent and push air out of your tent. This creates negative pressure and ensures that all the smells go through your carbon filter and they're not escaping through holes, let's say in your zipper or a cat hole, you know, if they climb up the side of your tent, which they will if you have cats and you let them and good luck stopping them. Uh, it's going to create little tiny holes. You don't have to worry about those holes if you have it sucking air in and pushing air out. You're going to need circulation fans. Circulation fans are going to provide a little bit of airflow, just like you might have a nice breeze outside going to provide a little bit of controlled stress, a little bit of wind stress, which is going to make those arms stronger and sturdier, less or more resistant to wind. Whereas if you had no airflow at all, they'd be really weak and easily manipulatable because they haven't needed to adapt to that, that stress, you know, pushing them around. Just like us, we grow under stress and in new situations, plants going to as well. You are going to need to control the environment in your tent. This means humidifier, dehumidifier, and I recommend you get what's called an inkbird controller. This controller has an outlet with outlet A and outlet B on it, and it lets you set when to turn on outlet A and outlet B. So you would set a low range humidity, let's say 50% for the low threshold, 65% for the high threshold. And when it's below 50%, it's gonna turn on outlet A, which might be a humidifier, once it senses the humidity has gone up above 65%, it's going to turn on outlet B, which is your dehumidifier. This is going to allow you to have a nicely controlled humidity and automate, you know, you having to plug one in, unplug the other, or having them fight. It's going to eliminate your humidifier and dehumidifier fighting each other. It's going to extend the life of the filter in your water uh, or in your humidifier. There's a lot of pros to using the controller, and I highly recommend it. I just want to note, uh, though we're going to do specific videos on choosing the, the pieces of equipment individually, you want to make sure the humidifier and dehumidifier you get is sized for the room that your tent will be in, not for the size of the tent. The reason for that is your exhaust fan is going to circulate the air in your tent rather quickly. Like every few minutes, it's going to have brand new air filling that space. So if you only got a humidifier and dehumidifier big enough for your tent, it would never catch up. It would never put off enough to, to really get the lung room that we're in right now and that the tent would be in up to where it needs to be. You're going to need a humidistat. While you don't necessarily need this, I guess, uh, it's pretty dang close to being a need. What a humidistat does is it measures the temperature and humidity. Whenever you're getting uh, or you're looking at purchasing a tool that takes accurate measurements, you don't want to skimp out on that. The more accurate and confident your measurements are, the more accurate and confident you'll be in the decisions you make based on those measurements. 
So this is one of those things where you don't have to buy an expensive humidistat, but you do want a humidistat that's gonna measure humidity and temperature. If you were just licking your finger and feeling the air and you're thinking, mm, yeah, it's about 75 degrees today, you're not gonna have a very accurate um, you know, measurement. And so you're not gonna make a very accurate decision from there and you're gonna be off from where you really should be. So humidistat's one worth, worth getting. Again, they're pretty cheap. So don't worry about the price on that one. You're gonna need some kind of medium. I'll be using Fox Farms Soil, probably Happy Frog and Ocean Forest. I start them in Happy Frog, I move up to Ocean Forest. The bottom line is you need some kind of medium to grow in, whatever that is. You don't wanna forget perhaps aeration, like perlite or vermiculite. I typically mix my soils 70% soil, 30% aeration, whether it's vermiculite or perlite. Um, I will have the list of all the things that we're talking about down in the description. So you've got a little bit of a shopping list. If you can hold off, don't buy things yet. Make sure you're making informed purchases, whether you're waiting for my videos to come out or you're just YouTube and Google searching how to purchase or how to choose a X, you know, how to choose a grow light, how to choose a humidifier for a grow room. You wanna look these things up so that you're making informed purchases, but I'll be bringing that to you here in the next few weeks as well. You're gonna need nutrients, whether you're feeding organically only or you're making a living soil by you know, mixing up your soil with all the food it needs in the beginning, or whether you're feeding bottled synthetic nutrients like I will be, and I recommend you, you follow along with me if you intend to by getting the same things. Uh, it's gonna make it a lot easier for me to help you and for me to answer your questions. We'll be on the same schedule. When it comes to nutrients, the brand really doesn't matter. I'm going to use Fox Farms brand because they have a Fox Farms feeding schedule that we can follow and it just makes it simple. But at the end of the day, it's the same elements getting into your plant regardless of how you feed them. You've got your big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and PK. And then you've got your micronutrients like zinc and manganese and magnesium and calcium and all these micronutrients that are all very important that should be in, in your bottled nutrients uh, somewhere in there or whatever kind of nutrients you're feeding. Nutrients are important. On that note, I also recommend getting liquid syringes. They're very inexpensive. And when you need to measure out five milliliters per gallon, which is one teaspoon, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. Uh, liquid syringes just help you get an accurate measurement, takes out the guesswork. It makes it so that you can get three drops really easy instead of just trying to tip the bottle and get just three drops. I've done it countless times and countless times I've poured too much and then you end up, you know, battling the pH or having to dilute your solution because you added too much nutrients. Um, so liquid syringes are highly recommended. You are going to need a way to measure your pH. This is probably no surprise. There are ways to grow where you don't really need to measure the pH of your water. But the way I'm growing, you're going to need to. and it's really just a good tool to have. It's one of those things where if you're having a problem, you wanna diagnose it by finding out the pH of the water you're feeding and maybe the pH of the soil by doing a slurry test. Sometimes even the pH of the runoff, though usually that's much less important and, and can be misleading uh, depending on the circumstances. I recommend getting a pH meter that can measure not just pH, which is you know how acidic or alkaline your uh, whatever you're measuring is, your liquid, but also a pH meter that has a, a functionality that allows you to measure electrical conductivity. It's often, often abbreviated as EC. This gives us an indication of how much fertilizer is in the solution. Also, you might see TDS, which is total dissolved solids, which does a similar job. The standard though is electrical conductivity. Um, so if your pH pen measures pH and electrical conductivity, you've got the right tool for the job. I recommend getting a second pH meter. Now, I don't recommend going and buying two of the same one if, if it's an expensive one that does t, uh, measure EC and pH, but just get a pack of litmus test strips. My first couple years growing, I had very low confidence sometimes in my pH meter. I always I'd add like a little bit of pH down and then I'd be mind blown that my pH is like 2.5 when it was just seven. It's such a drastic difference. 2.5 is very acidic. Um, in those cases, I would have loved to have had a litmus paper, a little piece of paper you put in the water, it turns a color, you measure it with a chart to see what pH that color represents. Um, and that way you can be confident in your measurement. Being confident in, in your accurate measurements 
is the first step to making informed decisions properly. If you're making a low confidence informed decision, it's really not worth that much because if things don't go exactly how you expect them to, now you're not even sure if you did what you think you did. Uh, so it's really important. It's a cheap solution that I promise you're gonna feel good that you've done by getting litmus paper along with your pH meter. Unless you just trust the pH meter entirely, but I distinctly remember many times really scratching my head, like, did I let it dry out too much? Did I, um, you know, drop it or something? This just doesn't seem right. And for that reason, the confidence of having two is great. Uh, so moving on from your pH meter, we're going to talk about water collection. I've used a wet a wet vac uh, many times, just vacuum up the water. It's okay. It has the added benefit of getting all the leaves that have dropped and things like that. You don't really want those sitting around being a, um, a host for pathogens and mold and whatnot. But you can also just get drip trays or water collection trays, like a, a little circle that goes underneath your pot. You might see them at Walmart or your big box stores. They're really nice, really simple. You don't need to be watering so that you have a ton of runoff most of the time. Um, so I recommend getting some kind of way to collect the water. It's, it's nice to think about that ahead of time before you've got a three gallon pot that you've just watered and now you've got a small lake inside your tent that you got to deal with. And then you're doing that every few days. It gets to be a pain <laughs> for sure. So consider that. I also recommend a scrog net. Scrog means screen of green. And what this is is just a trellis net, big net, square holes. I guess they could be circular, but they're usually square. Uh, this is going to help you train your plant and flower. There's different methods to growing, but this seems to be the most common. This is the one that I've always employed. Having a screen really helps uh, a scrog net. And so you don't need to purchase it in the beginning, but if we're talking about throughout the whole life cycle of your grow, what are you going to need? Keep in the back of your mind, you're going to be buying a net at some point. They're pretty inexpensive. You know, I wouldn't worry too much about breaking the bank, but it's important to have. You're also going to need around flower time, a microscope or a jeweler's loop and really throughout the whole life cycle of your grow. So the main purpose would be to, to look at the trichomes on your buds to determine their ripeness. If you've watched our last video, uh, the complete grow life cycle, you will remember that the way we determine if it's time to harvest is the color of the trichome heads. Amber is like the far end of ripeness and clear is not ripe at all. If you haven't watched that video, be sure to do so. Uh, at the end of this video, there'll be a little button for you to click on to watch another suggested video, and it'll probably be that one. Highly recommend you do watch the overview of the grow life cycle. It's going to help fit these puzzle pieces into place, and we're slowly working towards having a complete puzzle where everyone's got a nice foundational base of knowledge. The last video and this video are very important to do just that. Uh, microscope is also going to be important for looking at uh, if you have pests. So some mites, like let's say spider mites, a uh, uh, nightmare for growers. I'm sure maybe you've heard about spider mites if you've looked into growing at all as being like the dreaded thing you don't want because they're hard to get rid of. They're very hard to see. Um, so if you've got some damage on your plants, you kind of have like a checklist of things you're going to go through. You might look at your notebook if you've been writing down what you fed them and pH them to see have I overfed, did I use the wrong stuff, things like that. But you're also going to think, is there a pest? affecting my plant? Is there something sucking the nutrients out of the leaves, causing these little spots I'm seeing? Things like that. With a microscope, you can catch it before it's a catastrophic problem. Without a microscope, some of those mites, by the time you see them, it's like a cluster of thousands and it's too late. Um, so it's not only important for determining the ripeness of the trichomes. I might not even say that that's the most important part. Being able to identify pests early, prevention is most important, but being able to identify them if you have them, that is equally as important as knowing when to chop down your, your product, your cannabis. Um, so that one is one that you don't want to skimp on too much. Jeweler's loop works. You can spend thousands of dollars on a microscope. You don't need something like that. I'd maybe set your budget at 100 tops because there's some really nice Bluetooth microscopes out there for $60 or less. Um, but that's a necessity. You want to have that maybe even right from the start. You are going to need trimming scissors. So maybe also hangers, we'll say you've chopped down your plant, you hang them up on some hangers. Usually your closet has enough, but if you're short on hangers, you'll probably want to pick some up. They're real cheap. You're going to need trimming scissors when it comes time to trim. You could just use any old scissors, uh, but they get really resinous and sticky quickly. So you kind of want to buy some just for this reason. 
and probably some isopropyl alcohol at that point too. I usually just keep a cup full of isopropyl that I put the really sticky scissors into and then I take out some new ones, kind of cycle through them that way and that'll help you be more efficient, not get hung up on barely being able to open and close your trimming scissors. We're kind of getting into the ancillary final things here. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to trim bin. Not a need, but it's a want. It works just like the bottom screen in your grinder if you got a three-stage or four-stage grinder. It collects the trichome heads that you've brushed off, whether it's from the leaves that you trimmed off or just from handling the bud. Little trichome heads are gonna be snapping off, falling, and the screen on your trim bin is, is just the right size to let them fall through but not let plant material. It does a great job. It's gonna collect underneath the screen in the actual tray, all those trichome heads, and you're gonna end up with a beautiful, freaking beautiful, uh, like spread of keef. It's so beautiful. And you do what you want with the keef, you know? So it's not a necessity. You don't need to collect that keef. It's not like you're gonna have ounces of keef, but it's just a good way to, to get a little bit more out of your plants. You may as well use every little bit that you can, and this is a great way to do just that. It also reduces the um, mess, and there's just a lot of benefits of using a trim bin, so recommended. And then finally, you're gonna need containers to, to store your weed in. I recommend glass containers because that's what I've used, like a mason jar, or there's another brand of ball jars, ball mason jars. Um, doesn't have to be fancy, just needs to be airtight. And you usually want to get them a little bit bigger than you think you need because it sucks to open a lot of small ones if you do have to burp your, your jars. We talked about that in the last video. Don't always have to, but if you do need to because the buds are a little too wet, then the less lids you have to open every day, the better. It sucks to open 16 lids twice a day. You just kind of get sick of it. Like first few times you're admiring everyone. You're like, oh, so nice. It's a product of my hard work, fruits of my labor. Uh, by the end of the week, you're like, oh, God, I got to open all 16 jars before I go to the store again. <laughs> you know, uh, you can avoid that by getting uh, nice big jars. I think I had a couple more things on my list here. Ah, uh, Yes, you're going to want tape, zip ties. Uh, these are important just as, you know, multi-tools. If a branch snaps, you can tape it back together real quick and it'll heal. Zip ties are good for zip tying your plant to, to be in the shape you want it holding up fans, holding up lights. I mean, zip ties are just multi-purpose great tools to have, just like tape. You're gonna want both like duct tape, but also foil tape, which is reflective on one side, sticky on the other. It looks like aluminum foil is why they call it foil tape. Or it's probably because it's the same material, but that's how I think of it as. Uh, foil tape has a few uses that are really important. One, it's gonna connect your carbon fan and filter together really securely, so I recommend putting some on there. But you could also use duct tape for that. Foil tape is going to seal up any holes in the walls of your tent. So let's say your cat climbs up the side of the tent, and they will if you have cats, and good luck stopping them. It's just not going to happen. A little bit of foil tape on the inside covers that hole right up. It maintains the reflective property of the wall. It's pretty much the same material the walls of your tent will be made out of. And it's just really great for extending the life of your tent. I have three tents. And collectively, they're many, many years old, like four years old each. They have countless cat scratch holes. And I just repair it with a little bit of tape and they're good to go. The tape holds really well. It's, it's vital that you have some. On that note, I didn't mention earlier, you wanna have some ducting, uh, some ventilation tubing for your exhaust fan. So you're gonna hang your exhaust fan up in the tent and the carbon filter is gonna be on the the intake side so it's sucking air through the carbon filter pushing it out through the fan and then you that that fan's going to blow into a tube and out one of the holes of your tent you'll see pictures and you'll see what i'm talking about pretty clearly you want to remember to buy that tubing it's honestly nice to have some around if you're ever like moving tents or changing things around like having a little extra i always wish i do but it's not super cheap so don't worry about having extra it's not like you're going to need it that often uh, and then finally maybe tied for most important with the light, you're gonna need seeds or clones. You're gonna need some genetics. And you, what you get out of your grow is entirely capped at the potential of your genetics. You can be the best grower in the world, supplement CO2, really maximize what you can squeeze out of the genetics, but if it's just a bunk genotype, you know, it just is ugly looking, not that tasty, and maybe low THC, doesn't have any of the things you want, you're not going to get any of the things you want because the genes just didn't have that potential in them. 
Um, I am not an expert picker of seeds. It's something I don't have a ton of experience in so far. I've just been like, that looks good. That looks good. Ooh, that star pupil looks purple. Yes, I want that. And it's worked out well. But what it's taught me is that even when I've really done a great job, I've noticed that if I had better genetics, I would get a better product. It'd be more resinous or have a better bud structure that I'm looking for. So selectively choosing what strain you get, where are you getting from, uh, well-reviewed and known genetics is going to make a really big difference in your grow, like really, really dramatically different as far as what you're going to get out of it. It's just like deciding I'm going to grow a cherry tomato or I'm going to grow a big fat normal red tomato. They're very different and you want to choose the one that you want from the start or you'll be disappointed when it's not what you expected. Uh, clones are great because if you're getting it from a trusted breeder, like we will be seeing in the next year or two as the legal market opens up, but right now it's tough because you can't bring them over state lines in Minnesota. If it's a breeder that you trust, they can show you a picture of the nugs that their mother plant you know, has made or their other clones have made and you know exactly what you're going to get. That's awesome but it can also introduce pests. So you really wanna be careful with bringing clones into an existing grow, like really, really careful. Many a grow has been destroyed by bringing in clones that were gifted to them or whatnot, only to find they had mites or a little bit of boitritis, which is bud rot. Next thing you know, whole crops devastated. Uh, so you wanna be careful, but it's not a bad way to go. It's maybe the best way to go if you wanna get exactly, or if you wanna you know, know exactly what you're gonna get ahead of time. That pretty much wraps it up. I recorded a couple times. I'm really trying to get these down to 10 to 15 minutes. Please leave any questions you have down in the comments. Answering those questions benefits everybody. It helps the YouTube algorithm. It's answering questions that other people just didn't want to type out, but when they read yours, I promise they're going to be like, oh yeah, I'm glad they asked that because now I know. And if it's something that I don't know, like I always say, we'll both learn and then it's a win-win. That's the best case scenario is if you ask a question I don't know the answer to, because everyone is going to learn more by the end of the response. With that, you guys have a great rest of your day and stay tuned for the next videos where we'll be diving into how to choose each one of these pieces of equipment. What type of humidifier? What are the different types of humidifiers? What type of light? What are the different types of lights? We're going to dive into most of these pieces of equipment and really help you make an informed purchase real soon because we are getting close to August 1st. Happy growing.